May I call your attention to the Sermon on the Mount as recorded for us in Matthew chapter 6. To Matthew chapter 6, and I'm going to read for you from verse 9 to verse 13. Matthew chapter 6, verse 9 to verse 13. You find here the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and do not lead us into temptation but deliver us from the evil one for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen well brothers and sisters let me do some repetition repeating myself at the start of this sermon that we are having here brothers and sisters a model prayer it is a model prayer intended to guide us to teach Christians how to pray and for Christians to follow this model whenever they pray. It is famously referred to as the Lord's Prayer. And that gives some people a wrong idea that this was the prayer that Jesus prayed for himself. That's not what it is meant by the Lord's Prayer. Jesus cannot pray this prayer because you find in this prayer the confession of sin and our Lord has no sin. So this prayer is not meant for Him. It is meant to be a model prayer for us, for His people, in order to teach them how they are to pray whenever they pray. And we find here, brothers and sisters, in this model prayer, the Lord Jesus teaching you that you must address your prayer to God as your Heavenly Father. Our Father in Heaven, or in the Old King James, Our Father which art in Heaven. After that, you'll find six asking. you find six things you are to ask of God. The first three concerns the things regarding God Himself. God's name, God's kingdom, God's will. Remember that. Remember, you begin your prayer with the things of God first. And then, only after that, you come with three requests concerning your needs. Your physical needs and your spiritual needs. Your daily bread and your spiritual need for forgiveness as well as for personal purity which we considered last week. This model prayer is not meant for you to repeat chanting like the, like the other non-Christians. No, it is not meant for you to repeat, repeat, repeat many times. But it is meant to be a model, an example for you to remember. It is a short prayer. That is why many of you can remember it by memory because it's easy to memorize. This morning, we have come to verse 13, especially to the last section of verse 13, where you find a doxology. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The Lord's Prayer closes with a doxology. But brothers and sisters, don't worry, don't panic. If you are reading from a modern English version of the Bible and you realize that this doxology is missing, it is missing in all the modern English translation coming to you from America. Why? Because the Americans believe that it is not found in the Bible. It should be deleted. Why, you ask them, should it be deleted? They will tell you, because it is not found in the Gospel of Luke. So, if you turn with me now to the Gospel of Luke chapter 11, you will find that this model prayer is repeated there. He says in Luke 11, verse 1 to verse 4, look carefully here, this is what it says in your Bible. Now it came to pass as he was praying in a certain place when he sees that one of his disciples said to him, 
Lord, teach us to pray as John the Baptist also taught his disciples. So he said to them, When you pray, say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us day by day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And lead, and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Amen. You find that the doxology is indeed missing in this record here in the Gospel of Luke. But brothers and sisters, you must understand that when you look at this uh, passage of God's Word, that this was not a record of the Sermon on the Mount. Look at verse 1 again. He says, Now it came to pass as he was praying in a certain place. The Lord taught them this Lord's Prayer when he was praying in a certain place. The record of Matthew is that he was actually on a, giving a sermon in a Sermon on the Mount. So we are actually looking at two different times that our Lord Jesus Christ was teaching the same prayer. Once in the Sermon on the Mount, in another time here when he was praying and his disciples came to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray. And he taught them the Lord's Prayer as we would refer and call it. You understand that our Lord Jesus Christ spent three years in His public ministry from the start to the end when He died on the cross of Calvary. During this period of three years, you would expect our Lord Jesus Christ to repeat some of His teaching during different times and in different places during these three years. And there's nothing wrong repeating. I repeat my sermons here. And then sometimes PCC, and when I preach overseas, sometimes I use an old sermon to preach. And there is nothing wrong with that. We find all the famous preachers in history doing the same thing. And we find the Lord doing the same. We find here an, an example of what the Lord was doing. Just because the doxology is missing in the Gospel of Luke chapter 11, it does not mean that it cannot be in the model prayer that our Lord Jesus Christ taught in the Gospel of Matthew. But you see, the Americans, they all have this wrong concept that if it is not there, it shouldn't be here. And they feel that they have the right to cut it away. That is why, my beloved brothers and sisters, we must be very, very careful of modern people because we take the Word of God very lightly. We think that we are the expert and we can arrange the Bible according to how we prefer, forgetting that it is God's Word, it's not our property. We have no right to do to God's Word what we humanly think is this or that. <clears throat> it is not found in a few ancient manuscripts. It's not found in Matthew chapter uh, 6 and verse 13 is not found it's true in a few maybe three or maybe two ancient manuscripts but brothers and sisters it is found in more than 5,000 manuscripts are you listening to me it is not found in two or three famous ancient manuscripts but it is found in more than 5,000 manuscripts and yet, this expert say, Oh, but it's not found in these two or three famous manuscripts. Therefore, it shouldn't be in the Bible. What are you talking about? What about the 5,000 over where you can find? You see, it's very biased of these people to give people the impression that it is not found in the Lord's prayer. I bring all these unprofitable things to you in this sermon, not because I want to make you angry, but I want you to see, brothers and sisters, that we Christians living in this modern age, we need to be very careful. Especially with people who claim to be scholars and experts. Oh, they have a PhD. Oh, they came from this famous seminary or university. We have to be very weary of them. Because a lot of things they say is contrary to common sense, you know. 
and contrary to facts and evidence before us. And here we have an example. And so I want to persuade you, my beloved brothers and sisters, to stick to your Bible and to know that the people who have been teaching you, they have not taught you wrongly. For example, I want to say this, because this doxology, as it is found in our Bible in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 13, is actually referred to and is actually taught in our larger and our shorter catechism. So you hear what the shorter catechism, the shorter catechism has 107 question and answer. So we are looking at 107 question and answer. 107 says this. What does the conclusion the Lord's Prayer teach us? The conclusion of the Lord's Prayer which is For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Teaches us to take our encouragement in prayer from God only and in our prayers to praise Him ascribing kingdom, power and glory to Him. It is taught in our catechism. And yet a lot of Presbyterians who claim that they subscribe to the Westminster Confession of Faith and they do believe in the larger and shorter catechism, they cut the doxology away from their Lord's Prayer. So on Sunday, if they were to ask a congregation to repeat the Lord's Prayer, they will end with, and lead us not into temptation, but they deliver us from the evil one. Amen. Isn't it contrary to your catechism? Because it is found, it is taught in your catechism. It is in my catechism. And so it is the reason why I have devoted this sermon to call your attention to this doxology. In order that you will not have the idea that why is the pastor teaching us something that is missing in the Bible. It is not missing. It is in our Bible. It is in our catechism. And we must uphold it, defend it. And we must properly understand that it is part of the teaching our Lord Jesus Christ taught His people. The second point I want to call your attention to is this. If you look at this doxology, turning back to Matthew chapter 6 and verse 13, you learn this very important thing. At the end of the prayer, our Lord Jesus says, For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The Lord is teaching you as He's teaching you to pray here that praying is worship. Praying is worship. Again, reading a lot of books from the West, a lot of modern Christians are so influenced, they think that prayer and worship are two different things. They are separate entities, separate and, uh, uh, events and separate uh, uh, activities. It's not true, brothers and sisters. The Lord Jesus says, Every prayer you make must begin with, Hallowed be thy name and end with a doxology, engaging you from beginning to the end in the worship of God. And so you have to ask yourself, as you hurry along in your prayer, as you are too committed to people in front of you because you are eating with your colleagues and friends and many of them happens to be non-Christians, you do not want them to wait too long and therefore you hurry along. I wonder what the brothers and sisters, as you were praying, is your prayer a worship of God? Many prayer people never even thank God for the food they eat. And even if they do, they do not believe that praying is the worship of God. And here the Lord is teaching you that, that praying is worship. You must not think that praying is not. You ask God for help, you ask God for your needs in this world all the time. But have you ever thought, brothers and sisters, whenever you pray, you are to worship God. Our Lord Jesus calls you to worship God whenever you pray. You are to begin and you are to end your prayers with worship. You see, brothers and sisters, your prayer must not be self-centered. Your prayer instead should be God-centered. And that is important. 
Because increasingly, modern Christians are praying self-centered, self-centered prayer to God where God is never the center and God is never the person you worship. And so this morning, I want to call your attention to this, that praying is not bringing a shopping list to God. That's what a lot of people do. When they pray, they tell God, this is what I want, this is what I want, this is what I want, this is what I want. And God, just in case, this is what I need, this is what I need, this is what I need. And we list out everything. And we forget to worship God. People pray only when they are in trouble. Instead of praying because you want to worship God. That is why people say, but I cannot pray too long, no. After one minute, I don't know what else to say. It's true. Because you have already listened all you need from God. You already told God whatever you want from God. And therefore, you've got nothing more to say. But if you worship God, you realize that in prayer to God, you can sing because it's worship. And so therefore, this morning, you woke up, you say, Oh Lord, thank you for a new day. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty. You can sing to the Lord in your praying. How come? You I thought singing is a different activity. It is the same. You can sing in prayer. You can sing your prayer. Isn't that what we do? The book of Psalm this morning, as I read for you, Psalm 88. Isn't that a prayer? And people sing. They put it into music and they sing it. There's nothing wrong singing your prayer. Because praying is worshipping God. People pray only when they are in trouble. But you shouldn't be that way now that you have been taught by our Lord that praying is worship. It's not just in trouble, but also when you are well, when you have time, when you are remember, you must pray to God because it's worship. That is the reason why, brothers and sisters, people do not give thanks to God when they eat. Because they fail to remember before they eat, they give thanks in worship of God. That's the reason why true praying, true prayer is worship. And that is contrary to our sinful nature. That is why it is an activity that sinners do not want to engage in. That is why people, they do not mind coming to church for worship on Sunday. But most people will be absent if we have a physical prayer meeting. Why? Sometimes it's valid reason, they work late, it's too far to travel, it's too inconvenient for them, it's understood. But also at the same time, brothers and sisters, there is a spiritual reason, and that is because it's against our nature. To pray is contrary to our desire, it's repulsive to our desire, because we are sinful human beings. God is often far away, if not absent, from our minds and our hearts. That is why our Lord reminds us here through this Lord's Prayer that praying is worship. Therefore, we must remember that and we must constantly pray in worship to God. Tell me, will you fix your eyes on God when you pray? It's not your needs that you should be focusing on. You should be the person you are talking to. God, and He's the great King. You honor Him. You praise Him. You tell Him all your needs, yes. At the end of it all, you praise Him again and you thank Him that He understands you. He knows your needs and that He has the power to come to your deliverance. And I ask you to turn with me to Psalm 65. Look at what the psalmist says about God in Psalm 65 and verse 2. Psalm 65 and verse 2. Oh, you who hear prayer, to you all flesh will come. This verse first came to my attention when I was a student London. One day, the church gave us an assignment. 
say that can you go and visit somebody in hospital because the person is very ill, may pass away any time. And so Pastor Eric Kwang and I was given the assignment, so we took the tube and then we went to visit this person in a hospital. And we went in and we saw the person and we prayed with the person, we stayed there for a while. And on our way out, we saw a big sign hung there that says, with an arrow, to the chapel. And so Eric and I decided that, ooh, why don't we go and see what is the chapel? So we went in, and to our surprise, it was a very old chapel in the hospital, made of wood, it's all wooden. The wall wooden, even the pews, the chairs, all wooden, all in stock, and you cannot remove any of them, it's all nailed down. It's all wooden, and right in front there is this sign, O thou who heareth prayer, unto thee shall all flesh come. Psalm 62, 65 and verse 2. And our hearts was, was moved because we saw in front of us some of the patients and some of the loved ones of patients, some of them crying, I suppose, passed away, died, just died a few minutes ago or whatever. And some of them in tears, in pain, begging for God's mercy for their loved one who is seriously ill in the hospital. And we were moved. Eric and I, we went in there, we were moved. And so Eric and I, both of us said, look, what a wonderful, what a wonderful promise, what a wonderful place, what a good enticement for people to come and pray. O thou who hearest prayer, unto thee shall all flesh come. You see there, brothers and sisters, it is not about healing, it's not about have mercy, it's about worship. It's about remembering that God calls us to pray to Him and He promises that He will hear. It is not just a command to pray, it is a command to pray and He assurance, I will hear when you pray, I will hear. So, beloved brothers and sisters, we should engage in prayer because God promises to hear. Because praying is worshipping. Look at Daniel. He was separated from his family. He was away in a foreign land. He has to learn a new language. And he was not able to go back home for a visit for many, many years. He left as a young person in his teenage years. He died there as an old man. Never see his home again. He died in a foreign land. Did he lose his faith in God? If you turn to the book of Daniel, chapter 6, look at what Daniel regularly, daily, he would engage in, in Daniel chapter 6. And look at verse 10. In Daniel chapter 6 and verse 10, you read, And in his upper room, Daniel's upper room, with his windows open towards Jerusalem, Daniel knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as was his custom since early days. Look here, very important. He learned to pray from his early days when he was a young boy. And he never, never forget the spiritual gift of God. If you say that when you were young you pray and then you lost it, there's only one reason. You don't love God. There is another reason. You were never converted. Because look at Daniel. He has many reasons not to pray, you know. What kind of God, man? Allow me to be taken away by stranger. Allow me to be transported so far away. Allow me to be so away from my family and everything familiar to me. Look, I have to learn a new language. You know? I have to survive, you know. And I will die in that foreign land. No chance to go back anymore. Why should he believe in God? Many of you will think like that. He never blessed me. But Daniel trusted in God. Daniel never doubted God. There must be a reason why he allowed me to be in Babylon instead of in Judea. And Daniel believed in God. 
And he tells you here that he thanked God. He gave thanks before his God. He gave thanks even. He gave thanks, brothers and sisters. He was worshipping God three times a day. How many times do you pray every day? I'm not asking you how many times you give thanks for your food. Ah. I'm asking you how many times you purposely set a time, time for worship. Mini worship. Because praying is worshipping. Daniel three times. David tells us he five times. We are not following the Muslim. It's just that people pray. And so I hope that you think about all these things. Learning the good example and a habit of godly men in the Bible. I come to the last point. And you learn here, if you come back to Matthew chapter 6 and verse 13, you'll find here in this doxology how to worship God. It says here, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. After you have asked God for your physical needs and your spiritual needs, you realize the Lord Jesus continues to read, for yours is the kingdom. After focusing on your needs and telling God what you need and telling God and asking from God what you need, you must return to God focus. Because after all, the chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. You focus on God and you express your adoration of God. You remember that what you prayed for should be for God's glory. Yes, you're asking God for deliverance. Yes, you're asking God for healing. Yes, you're asking God for your needs. But remember, everything you ask for, ultimately, must be for the glory of God. You conclude your prayer with God. You begin your prayer with God, hallowed be your name. You end your prayer with the kingdom, your power, and your glory. That's what you find in the prayers recorded for you in the Holy Bible. If you turn to the Old Testament, to the Old Testament, to 1 Chronicles, 1 Chronicles, you look at verse 29, sorry, chapter 29 of 1 Chronicles, and verse 11, you find there in that prayer, Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, and the glory, the victory, and the majesty, for all that is in heaven and in earth is Yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head over all. You understand, brothers and sisters, this is a prayer. But let, let me ask you very honestly, Anna, reply to me, brothers and sisters. Have you ever prayed like that? It should be a prayer that you can pray. That's worship. That's worship, isn't it? Praying is worship. But have you ever repeated this prayer? Have you ever prayed in this manner? This is worship. This is praying and worshipping at the same time. I hope that you'll take a highlighter and highlight it in the, your Bible and carry along with you the next time you pray and then you say our Father in heaven and then you talk about God's greatness and power and learn and make it a part of your heaven. Then again, brothers and sisters, I call your attention to Psalm, to Psalm 145. Look at what you are told there in Psalm 145 as another example of praying. Psalm 145 and verse 13, you read there, Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures throughout all generations. Have you ever said that to God? Have you ever worshipped God for that? Well, you see, your praying is so poor. If you are to take an exam, humanly speaking, I think you will score very poorly even. You may fail in your praying. Why? Because you have shortened your prayer such that it's all about what you need. There is no worship of God. There is no concentration on God. Instead, we find over even in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul, while he was writing his epistle, 
he was worshipping God at the same time while thinking about the great things of God. For example, if you turn to 1 Timothy, for example, look at what he says in chapter 1, to 1 Timothy chapter 1. And look at what he writes in verse 17. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 17, the Apostle Paul says, Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, to God, who alone is wise, be honor, glory, forever and ever. Amen. You realize he was writing. And yet, yes, he was writing, he was worshipping God. Because a Christian life is a life of worship. When he was talking to people, he was just talking to them. And suddenly you think about God, you say, oh, the wisdom of God is beyond comprehension. You see? And so I have just nearly given you some examples of what it means by worship is praying and praying is worship. The Lord Jesus ends the Lord's Prayer with the doxology. He says, For yours is the kingdom and the power and glory forever. Amen. Many people do not know why the word Amen is being used by Christians. Some people even think that the word Amen is magic. It's a magic formula, magical formula. You must say Amen. If you don't say Amen, God will never listen to that prayer. But that's not what the word Amen means. The word Amen comes from the Hebrew. The Hebrew word Amen means, so let it be. So let it be. I pray to God. I come to the end of my prayer after worshipping God and I say, Lord, so let it be. So let it be. And then when you hear people praying at a prayer meeting, we see people praying after one another, I want you to know, brothers and sisters personally, it's a great encouragement for me as your pastor to hear you pray. One after another. And everyone say Amen at the end of each prayer. It means to God, it means you telling God, I heard the prayer, I wasn't sleeping, I heard the prayer, Lord, so let it be, as the person has prayed. And so it's important, my beloved brothers and sisters, to say Amen. We are actually joining ourselves with the person who had just prayed. We are saying, I agree, and I support, I second the, what the person prayed for. So, as Christians, we have a responsibility to be united in this matter. We have come to the end of the Lord's Prayer. In our last few weeks, we have been looking at it. And I hope that you learn something from it. If you find that it's difficult to remember everything that I've said from the sermons, I want you to remember this and carry this along with you for many, many months or years to come, and that is this. Praying is worship. Praying is worship. It doesn't need to be words. It can be singing to God in prayer. And may God help you all, my beloved brothers and sisters, as you pray for one another and for our church. Let us pray.